Hello and welcome to Remainders, the podcast that brings you discussions of movies, old, new, stuff that just doesn't even come out yet. We are joined every week by my co-host and friend, Patrick McIntyre. Pat, say hello. How are you doing? I am doing great. How are you today? Well, I am doing excellent. If you're joining us on YouTube, don't turn that dial, as they used to say, because we are here to talk about an incredibly crazy movie called Body Heat, starring Kathleen Turner and William Hurt. Um, basically, in the 80s, it was the modern version of Double Indemnity, which it was my first time seeing it this week, and I was surprised at how quickly I thought, man, is this Double Indemnity? Are we watching a remake of Double Indemnity? It is also the very first film by Lawrence Kasdan, who directed and wrote the film. And you might know Lawrence Kasdan from directing what movie, Pat? Big Chill. <laughs> okay. But also, did, I, think most people, I think most people would know him from directing The Empire Strikes Back. Uh, wait a minute. I knew he wrote it. Wait a minute. Okay, so I'm having a... Where I'm pretty we... sure he directed Empire Strikes Back too. And like, please, if I get this wrong, I want to feel like a total heel. <laughs> I mean, I know he wrote. Uh, uh, um, oh, Empire. maybe he didn't direct it. What, wait, so wait, let's see. Did George Lucas direct Star Wars Empire no. Strikes Back? Um, I, I mean, I may be completely off, but um, no, he didn't direct uh Empire. He wrote it. So that's, that's, I'm okay, assuming I, he I wrote got close. Raiders. Yeah, you, you got very close. He wrote Raiders of the Lost Ark and uh, wrote Empire Strikes Back. Uh, why is his name um, escaping? I mean, we should be able to find this out right now. But here's the thing this was his first directorial debut. And I looked at his filmography after checking out, you know, whoa, I, of course you've heard the name Lawrence Kazan, but when you check out his filmography and see all of the things that he's been involved in, it is pretty insane. Um, and he was also part of 2015, the, the Force Awakens, as a writer, which is yeah. uh, amazing. I didn't know that, and I love the Force Awakens. Um, yeah, it was Irvin Kirshner who directed uh, Irvin Empire. Kirshner, of yeah. course. How could I forget that? Who went on to direct uh, RoboCop two or three, which is I've never seen because they're not worth watching. <laughs> what you've never seen? It? How do you know they're not worth watching if you haven't seen them? Uh, because everybody who is a diehard Robohead, like I am. Um, very few, if any, are fans of the second or third one. So. Amazing. Okay. Well, yeah. hey, everybody out there, I'm sorry. I, I fucked that up. Lawrence Kasdan did not direct it, but he did write a bunch of great movies, including Empire Strikes Back, but he did direct this one and wrote it, and it's Body Heat. So uh, this is a neo-noir, but it's also, as they call them, erotic thrillers, which has actually been very big right now. Criterion has a whole list, and this is actually where I saw this film pop up in the erotic thriller it's kind of, I guess they would, what do you call that when they put them all together? That's a, uh, they're curating these things these days. Yeah. So all these films uh, were on the criterion and I decided to watch it one day and I liked it. I watched it about a week ago and I really liked it. And I just said, you know, Pat and I were discussing what to talk about next. And I said, well, how about Body Heat? And he's like, I've seen bits and pieces. So now that you've seen the full film, what do you think? I mean, I absolutely loved it. So I'm very surprised. I thought this was a movie that you were all in on uh, for a long time. This is definitely way up your alley. Uh, oh, yeah. I was looking up for you to uh, kind of point out to all the, uh, I mean, I knew it was basically a remake of Double Indemnity, but I'm sure there are other um, references to Hitchcock. Um, so yeah, I'm actually just learning right now. This is the first watch for you. Um, Cause yeah, this is definitely right up your uh, alley in terms of uh, all the Hitchcock vibes and everything that you've been into. And I know you've been rocking that um, curation for the erotic 90s, so. Yeah, and like I said, it's like a lot of podcasts are talking about like erotic 90s, erotic 80s. And it is an interesting, you know, list to curate because a lot of these like neo-noirs and stuff like that, they are like, I guess what makes them even more sexy is that they're like, got this element of like, you know, the double crossing or the person that you're attracted to and you have this like steamy romance with but then they're the ones who are ultimately your demise which is the case in this film <laughs> which is also the case in double indemnity right and yeah. there's murder there's you know plots of uh a lot of deceit going on 
relationships are a bitch aren't they yeah relationships are a bitch and and this is 1981 so it's quite a while after and i'm trying to think you know has there been mm, has there been this close of a remake to double indemnity since then i don't think so plenty of homages uh, i'm thinking of uh, i don't know i i'm, I'm having images of plenty of um, movies that were like C and B level, like try to uh, knock off sort of Hitchcock, but I don't think anybody's, uh, certainly not in the mainstream. Like um, this movie was pretty successful in 81. And um, to, to kind of go back to like what you were talking about, uh, how much of there's been like a focus on like erotic 80s and 90s. Um, I was really thinking, I mean, it's largely because movies are so sexless these days. Uh, there's just like, there's very little nudity, there's very little sex in movies. And that's a uh, byproduct of like, corporations kind of taking the heed of movies. Also the availability of porn and how ubiquitous that is. It's like movies don't have to fill in that uh, gap for the average person who just wants to see naked people every once in a while anymore. When that was just kind of the standard back before uh, technology took that over. Gotcha. So you're, I think what you're trying to say is a movie these days doesn't need to spend that much time going through and getting into the steamy parts of it because they can just look it up online anytime they want. And that's, again, yeah. it's kind of like violence. Violence is like, it's got to be done the right way now because like everybody's done it every yeah. single which way, you know, it's like almost yeah. these days, what you don't show is the scariest thing, which is all back to the Hitchcock days. And I'm definitely, of, you know, yeah. I'm definitely talking mainstream. Like, you, there's plenty of like fucked up movies uh, that you can find in the indie scenes and whatnot throughout world cinema, especially. But uh, mainstream U.S. films, like this, was a this is what you would like body heat. If you went to the theater in '81, like this is like the feature that most people were going to be watching uh, on a Friday or Saturday night, and that's just non-existent anymore. Yeah, pretty amazing. So, for all of you out there that are listening and want to know what this movie is about. If you haven't seen Double Indemnity, this movie follows closely that storyline. It's somebody who's in a position of sort of not really doing amazing in life. Uh, the character of Ned, played by William Hurt, uh, rest in peace, by the way. And it's not like he's doing really terribly, but he's just kind of like uh, in this position where he just kind of like slinks along and is like get, getting by doing what he's doing and it kind of average guy, you know, an average Joe, but he's, he's a little hard boiled, just like uh, Walter Neff is in double indemnity. You know, he's got this kind of like little hard exterior and he meets Maddie, who's Kathleen Turner, who's married to someone who's very wealthy and he doesn't really realize it, but she's playing him and she has this ultimate goal um, to get rid of her husband, just like double indemnity. And so the story goes on where people are telling him to be careful. A lot of times people are telling him to be careful, which doesn't happen much in double indemnity. You know, uh, you're as a viewer, you're very much with Walter Neff and you kind of understand that like he's going down a road that he shouldn't go, but nobody else knows in this film, nobody really knows, but they also know getting involved with her is trouble. And so uh, even the guy who is uh, played by Mickey Rourke, by the way, which I'm sure we'll talk about, he's the one who gives him the bomb and says like, you probably shouldn't do this, but you know, here you go. So he gets entangled and of course it blows up in his face. Uh, pardon the pun there, because that's obviously how uh, things um, unfold for the demise of Kathleen Turner's husband. But along the way, a lot, a lot, a lot of nudity and steamy scenes in based in Miami, Florida, which uh, the heat only adds to the drama, just like in Do the Right Thing. Oh, it's a steamy movie, all right. Not as much sex as I was actually expecting. Uh, like I said, like this is, um, you know, pretty common for the times. It was definitely a, uh, a movie that was like seen as like, this is uh, the one to go to see if you want to see a bunch of people naked, but like, this seems pretty tame at the time. Um, William Hurt, so we could start in. Uh, fucking amazing, I love William Hurt. Um, what would you say is like your go-to Hurt uh, performance? Oh man, it's so interesting. Um, he's not like one of my favorite actors, but of course I know him in so many things. Um, I really loved him and he, I thought he played like an interesting character in The Village. I know that's probably not like one of his most famous roles, but um, nice. yeah, I actually yeah. did did love him in The Village. Um, I forgot about that one. Yeah. 
And correct me if I'm wrong, but he's he's the guy from Dune as well, right? Uh, the original Dune? You know, I've never seen... I know, neither have I. That's why I'm saying I don't know. I'm trying to think about what his most like popular film has been. Well, I mean, Broadcast News is definitely one of his uh, more popular uh, performances. I think he may have won an Oscar for that one. Um, for me, it's a, a history of violence. Um, his 10-minute drop at the end as uh, Vigo's brother is, and that was definitely nominated. He may have even won for that uh, performance. That is kind of my uh, perfect uh, William Hurt uh, uh, performance. Just it's certainly my favorite. When he drops in uh, in that movie, he just, he, he backs the wall up in such a short amount of time uh, with Vigo. Uh, it's so good. Such a great David Cronenberg for him. It's definitely on one that uh, I would love to cover in the soon. Cool. Yeah, I'm just looking at his filmography here, and um, there's a lot of um, looks like um, superhero movies. Uh, he was in the Hulk as well, which I didn't know. Um, but he, well, he, was in the, he was in the Eric Bana Hulk, the, the pre Marvel. Oh, right, one, which, right, right, which right. I, I which I love the Ang Lee one. Uh, um, it's great. He died in in March of 2022 last year. Yeah. Um, and he's got one hell of a mustache in this film. Oh, it's, okay, it's so great. So the mustache, so he is uh, uh, a dope in this movie. Like he's not like an overt uh, dummy, but he's, he, he plays, I mean, they start the movie talking about like, um, so his um, colleague played by Ted Danson, like just a year before um, Cheers. Cheers, Brothers, yeah. Um, he says a line, it's like, um, you're finally using your your um, uh, lack of intelligence to get ahead, or something like that. It almost sounded like he was doing it uh, purposely, but not really. So it's like he's kind of coming off of a, a legal malpractice, uh, and the way he carries himself, he's certainly not uh, like an overt um, idiot or anything. But he comes off as like um, someone who could kind of easily take advantage of and that's when the, when i kind of noticed that i was like all right this guy's already the patsy in this movie i can already tell right but there is like this hard-boiled like totally. component yeah. and and probably which is why like because he's so hard-headed is probably why he doesn't listen to any of the advice that he's getting right. but you're but it's a kind of like yeah. a, a perfect mix of that and he plays it really exactly. well i think oh yeah. so good i mean what's uh there's the line um that uh, kathleen turner maddie says um you're too you aren't too smart are you i like that in a man it's like when they're like courting like at the bar i think when they were saying that in first kind of like having their tango um which is like uh, perfectly captures um uh, his kind of solo uh vibe that he gives off so yeah and he's got this really great scene where he has dinner with uh the man that he ends up killing uh maddie's Richard husband Krina. Yeah, and that scene I thought he, I thought William Hurt was so good in. Um, he yeah. does play it like again because he's he can kind of play like the dummy that can you know totally get taken advantage of by Kathleen Turner. But when he's at that dinner, he's I feel like he's really playing her husband yeah. really well, and that's um, a credit to William Hurt's acting for sure. Yeah, I mean, so you do believe so Kathleen Turner is like such a good uh, uh, gives such a good performance in this. And it was, it, it, halfway through, it kind of blew my mind because I rewatched um, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit a couple of weeks ago. And this, so this is basically uh, the, uh, the movie that she did the performance from. It's like it, she almost like duplicated uh, this performance in Body Heat for Jessica Rabbit in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Wow. Um, it's, it's like to a T. It's like playing the same character, same kind of voice, same kind of vibe that she's doing, obviously, through a, a cartoon character roger rabbit but um halfway through i was like god damn this is exactly why she was hired as jessica rabbit uh, for that movie <laughs> you know and the other thing about her is she's got such a great career i mean um i think my favorite film of hers has got to be serial mom i mean i'm sure you love that too john waters at his like peak best um one of those that's definitely movies. on our list to watch though. oh yeah <laughs> um but what I was going to say really quick, um, yeah, go ahead. she's so like alluring that like, that's why I feel like his character, uh, Ned, is is genuine in that scene, that you were, in that dinner scene that you were talking about. Like he is, he's not necessarily smart, but he's being led by lust in that scene. And he's going to 
take what uh, uh, it needs to be done to like trick his husband into thinking that everything's cool. Yeah, it's kind of like that amazing scene where like uh, he kind of plays it a little bit like this, where that scene in Royal Tannenbaum's where Richie Tannenbaum is on the the roof and he's like finds out <laughs> you know that uh, something what was it she she uh, Gwyneth Paltrow was cheated on or or what happened? He's like, what should we do? Should we get him? <laughs> and then he punches his hand through the window. Oh right, it's right, so right, like yeah, an yeah. understated like jealousy and rage inside the character, but like the other characters don't know that like they care so much about this other person. I feel like that's got a little bit of that in that scene where he's at the table. Cause he's just like, he's, he's being on his best game because he knows he wants to be with her. So good. Richard Krina, which I really haven't seen him in anything other than like Ram the Rambo movies and hot shots part to the, which he plays the same exact character in that one. So it was actually awesome to see him because he was a uh, character actor for many years before the Rambo movies, just not really a lot, a lot of TV and a lot of like TV movies, it seems like. So it's pretty awesome to see him like in this kind of noir style movie uh, outside of like a Sylvester Stallone action movie. Yeah, for sure. And that's the thing is like when you get into like these 80s kind of um, decade movies, you see some of those like, reoccurring character actors come back like him and it it, it, you know, it feels nice it's like oh awesome you know um I really love that and I also love like these days if like there's like a really old version of them that like somebody like obviously was a fan of this like you know unknown yeah. kind of character actor that you just saw pop up in every film and then they put him in like a newer film and like there's just some people in the audience that are like that guy I love that guy you know but go, going back to Kathleen Turner a little bit, like that deep voice of hers, so perfect for a new, noir movie. And also like there's something about her in these early films where she's get. I think this was her, um, one of her first films, if not the first film where she kind of like blew onto the scene. And yeah, I, she's not, she's a different kind of beauty, you know, she's not like this, um, she's got some danger in her, I guess is the point. And it is alluring. You know what I mean? It's like, this is something I shouldn't be a part of, but it just draws you in more and more. And she's perfect for that. Um, did you ever see the Romancing the Stone films? I saw Romancing the Stone. I almost saw it again at the music box, not that long ago when they did this Zemeckis um, uh, series. Oh, um, that's right. That's Zemeckis. Yeah. 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 That's the thing about, again, that's why they did Zemeckis because he's been like so in ubiquitous and like in the helm of like so many big movies for 40 years um, but his name is not always like the person you attach to those movies um it's been so long uh since i've seen it i saw it in like high school maybe even middle school um, i can like feel it right now um having like the taped versions off of the television and like <laughs> yeah, the vhs's right. oh, man we we i used to watch those all the time and it's been a while too since i've seen them but there was like Jewel of the Nile, Romance in the Stone i don't know if it was a trilogy or not maybe just two films but anyway she was freaking awesome in those and so is uh michael douglas and like such a weird like he's like an adventurer guy you know yeah um and i really really loved her from those and of course like i said uh serial mom but seeing her in this i had like a, I, uh i don't know we talked about this i guess a couple episodes ago when you we were talking about body double and you were mistaking it for this title so maybe that's like the thing is, is it kind of gets like lost in the mix of all these things because it's got body heat body double and when i saw the name i think i was just like oh I, I gotta see this i remember you you mentioning that you had seen a little bit of it and i'm so glad i did because like kathleen turner i had kind of forgotten a little bit about what she's been doing and what she's been up to and how much i really loved her as an actress and now that i've seen this i'm like even more like damn i got to check out more movies she's been in yeah no this, so this is her first movie uh, first film. She was on a TV series before that, but uh, this is the first one. And yeah, she's got that husky kind of voice. Very, I mean, super sexy. She's hot as hell in this movie. Um, I was wondering, like, so she's like full on naked on some parts, but they do have some close ups. So I was wondering if they were using like stunt butts, uh, which was not an unheard of thing uh, right. for a long time. So yeah, uh, I was wondering if that was going on for both of them, actually. Um, yeah, no, she, I mean, it makes sense, um, like I said, using Zemeckis, using her for um, 
grab it because like she just embodies this role like so perfectly and she is like like i said i even i could even tell that he was being set up but not necessarily directly by her like that's how good she is it's like it's yeah like she it's so obvious that she is the one uh orchestrating everything the whole time once you watch the whole movie but even if you kind of like knowing that in the front of your mind at the beginning it's like she's still so convincing especially with the i mean the sex scenes and everything that uh, she's uh, uh doing to kind of entrap him it seems genuine you're right so this femme fatale character i mean she gets him he is drawn in and he's all in on killing her husband, which she does, but he says, let's not be greedy. We can get away with this if we do it the right way. But then he gets to the um, will, the, the reading of the will. And there's yeah. that great scene where the guy's like, one of the lawyers is like, does anybody mind if I, if I smoke? And everybody in the room lights up because everybody, it's like the tension is so, so thick. Uh, love that scene. That was so <laughs> that was- well written and so well done. I was cracking up when they did that slow pan and everybody's uh, nestling into their smoke. They're like, oh shit, we're going to be here for a while talking about this death and the consequences of it. <laughs> right. And then I love the fact that they make William Hurt's character tell her like, this basically means that you inherit all of it and none of his family is going to get any of it. And right, it was right. so such a great little thing to like add a little bit of the uh, twist of the knife, you know. And she's like, oh, I'm going to get everything. That's crazy. (laughs) And that's the thing is William Hurt knows if that happened, it's going to look, you know, it's going to be red flagged and it is of course. So then he leaves basically the courtroom and goes back and then he's got good old uh, Sam Malone from cheers uh, that who who has already had one of, one of his beers from the fridge, of course, um, sitting there waiting to tell him like, yo, what are you in? You know, you're in some trouble if you're involved with her uh his line someday your dick is going to lead you into a very big castle uh <laughs> it kind of sets up uh the entire movie itself right there um yeah man yeah i mean yeah the first half is like yeah he's 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 he was led pretty easily into um considering murder uh just for this woman that he happens to be banging at the time so yeah it's pretty crazy and i will tell you that by that point you know, as an audience member, you're, you still don't really, I mean, you pretty much figure that he is like, you know, in trouble, but you're not sure they're going to get caught. You don't, not sure how it's going to play out. It's, it's, it's actually the end half of the film is pretty, does a pretty well, good job of keeping you on the edge of your seat, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Like I, like I said, like I felt pretty early on that he was uh, going to get um, the blame for something. Uh, but it definitely went in a lot of different directions uh, than I uh, uh, was not expecting. So, and that's the thing. It's like I've talked about this. It's like I don't plot movies are like only plot. Like it just doesn't always. It's not always like the first thing I look for in watching a movie. But like when you have a movie like this where the performances are so good and it's more of like um, the vibe rather than the actual uh, plot. Uh, mechanics uh, that gives you um, uh, everything that you need to know like that's that's what I love about it so and I always love like in films when there's like these little things that they add on to the characters that you just know are like their things and like it's kind of like a little like fun thing and that that happens with um, uh, Ted Danson's character whenever he goes into that diner he they like give him two iced teas you know like they know him like it it just it just gives like the audience the understanding that like these guys go here all the time and like this is like the kind of guy he is that he like always has to have two of these and um that was just those are just like little moments in movies that i love just so well done Char- like kind of adding to the character and how cool they are it's so fucking hot that he needs two iced teas so yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah and they're obviously adding to the fact that like you can't feel the heat so like they're doing whatever they can to let you know it's really fucking hot here um, and he even says, William Hurt says to the little girl who, <laughs> that's a, that's a crazy scene. There's a little girl that like walks in, like, you know, there is two instances where people find out in Kathleen Turner's world that she's having an affair most likely. And one is the little girl of like her best friend. Right. And she sees her having sex. And then there's that scene where he's like, I'm sorry, it's so hot in our town for you. Uh, when he sees her again. And like, it's obvious, like, this little girl has seen me boning Kathleen Turner. And then the other one is when he comes to the back of the gazebo 
and he tells that girl's mother um what does he say he says something like uh i don't know something like you take off your clothes or something she turns around and is like oh okay you guys are fucking but like <laughs> you know you thought any mistakes Catholic no yeah, so that's mistakes. that's the um that's the double right that was her friend that they switched right uh, sorry right. yeah that, yes yeah. exactly yeah yeah he walks up to her he's like hey we should fuck and yeah she just turns around he's like holy shit sorry for yeah. saying that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's like now i feel like a jerk <laughs> well he's well hey, that's a perfect example of like he's being um you know you know he's 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 being himself but also like he's just kind of a dummy he even says to himself i gotta be more careful with this shit if i'm gonna be uh having sex with this uh a married woman uh, in this estate but then like that's the same thing as like he tells like his friends who are basically gonna bust him like and he knows he's like walking the razor's edge he's like i'm gonna keep going over there right, and right. May maybe maybe i'll get lucky and she'll fuck me to death <laughs> great line uh his dick is leading him to a very big hassle uh as as dancing warned him very much so yeah it's cool to see ted danson in that role he is uh it's because you know you know how big of an actor is i mean ted danson these days like every time you turn on the television i feel like you're going to see him in something you know like there was a there was a while there for like the last 10 years where he was in like everything uh you gotta remind me yeah what has he he's been doing a lot of like um tv work right i mean he's doing a ton, yes and a lot of stuff with uh hbo like um what was that show i can't remember the name of it but he did it with jason oh, schwartzman the, the schwartzman and uh galifianakis yeah yeah bored to, bored to death right yep and then I did he, watch was, some of that. Yeah. he was also he, in Fargo, uh, I want to say season one or season two. Then he was also in. Uh, um, I haven't kept up with that. He's he's always popped up in Curb. Every once yes, in, a while in Curb, for like the of last course. 20 years. So that's yeah. where I've kind of kept up with him. But yeah, it's. But yeah, he's always kind of just making an appearance somewhere and I love it. It's like, he kind of, I feel like he just kind of does what he wants, you know, and somebody approaches him with something cool. He's like, all right, I'll do it, you know. I mean, he's got like a, a like, the good place is like a long-running sitcom it seems like he was on like csi i thought he did like something with csi for a while for a couple of years oh, a bunch of years it looks like yeah he's been doing like cbs uh tv which i was thinking about the other day when you look at the numbers the amount of people who still watch like cbs and like csi and all those shows it's like it's astounding how many people still watch those movies, that those uh, stations and those shows. It's like you never hear anybody talking about that. It's just like an example of like disconnect of like social media and online uh, discussions about stuff. I'm it's glad like you brought that nobody's up. Nobody's like yeah. watching CSI and going on Twitter and talking about it. <laughs> right. It's kind of like um, basic television stations now, yeah. right? Like just like your basic five, nine, two, right. seven. It's like the, the, the large older population who still have cable those those are the uh people bulking up those numbers across the well so uh after we watched um six feet under my like fifth time watching the series and my girlfriend's first she was telling me she's like oh i was like looking up all the characters finally i get to like look at what everybody's been doing so i don't have any spoilers and then she was mentioning that uh um, peter kraus has been on like the number one television show on either nbc or whatever that cop show and i was like, like that's the number one show and he's she's like yeah it is a cop show isn't it yeah i yeah. knew it was on something that either it was like a firefighter or a cop um yeah. i've definitely never seen it but that's the number one show like that's what she said mm -hmm. i mean there, yeah but there's probably a lot of different metrics like time slots and days and whatnot but i, I believe it it's like that's the thing it's like uh the amount of tv shows that do get produced for normal well because we would say shows, so. peter kraus yeah we heard he was on some like you know television show as a police officer and you know but yeah it's on like basic cable <laughs> yeah. we, we don't watch it but uh, yeah but number one show it's fucking awesome you know and because we love peter kraus of course we love nate fisher oh my god so great so back uh, to your body heat i mean you so you're you're a fan you like this film i love it I had such a great time watching it, and it was because like I was so in on it instantly because I was familiar with it, and and like I said, again, um, familiar with uh, Kazdin, like like I mentioned, the Big Chill is really great, um, and I was definitely aware that he was uh, the writer for like Raiders and Empire, and um, 
and the newer Star Wars as well. So I was really interested in seeing it. And yeah, I didn't, I, I knew it had some sort of Hitchcock um, illusion. And so once it started, I was like, oh, this is pretty clearly double indemnity. And then that's what it, I was really in on it, like thinking like, well, this is definitely a movie that Darren uh, was all in on. And that's why I was surprised that you had not seen it before. Well, that's like why I kind of mentioned us covering this. It's It's been a while since the two of us have watched a movie that we both hadn't seen. Don't you think? I mean, when's the last time we've covered a film we where we're just we kind of like reaction films of the first time seeing it? Um, like Elvis is the only other one that I can think of with us doing that. Because like all the movies that we, I mean, kind of the point of the podcast is like showing the shit that we like and want other people to see. So yeah, we really right. haven't seen uh, too much that neither of us have watched. But you're right. As soon as I got into it, I was like, man, this feels so Hitchcock. This feels so dumb and dumb. This feels so noir. And of course that's like my favorite genre. So I was really, really into it. Um, I, I, I was very satisfied with the way that it ended. Of course, like spoiler alert um, for anybody who's watching uh, or listening and does not want to know, you can turn off right now, but um, William Hurt ends up going to jail but he's sitting there thinking about it, you know, how did she get away with this? How did she do it? And the ending is pretty satisfying because it also leads it up to us. Like, did she really like William Hurt, you know, and she got away with it. Yeah. She's on an Island with some, you know, boy toy or whatever. And she switched her name with uh, the person from high school. And he found out when he got the yearbook in jail and he's like, Oh, so that's how she did it. But of course, nobody's listening to him and nobody cares about him because he's in jail. So he's rotting away but she got away with it. But is she really happy? It seems like she's almost in a jail of herself. Um, the way that she reacts in the ending of the film, I, I kind of really liked the way that this ended. It was kind of satisfying for me because I didn't really know if she felt like, wow, I got away with it. And now I'm happy. I, I felt like she got away with it. And now she's like, but I really liked William Hurt. And now there's no chance for that. Uh, yeah, they definitely leave the end shot of her looking pretty miserable. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely, I believe she had feelings for him, but at the same time, it's like. She has feelings for all that money too. <laughs> right, yeah. It's like, I don't know, maybe it's my pessimistic uh, view on it, but like, I mean, she's, she, her plan went off uh, more than perfectly. I still find it pretty fucking hilarious that like, so the way she initiated the meeting was hearing through a friend um, about Ned, that this he was just kind of like this, um, um, kind of terrible lawyer who suffered from legal malpractice and that's why she chose him to like she targeted him um, because she knew this was somebody who I could kind of seduce and then when it comes to doing the lawyer work for the will he's probably going to be doing it wrong uh, which led to her uh, owning everything in the uh, in, in the inheritance Right. So it's like, I love that, like, that's such like uh, out on a limb thing. It's like, oh, well, this guy's not that great of a lawyer. So hopefully he'll fuck up at the right time, <laughs> which will <laughs> yeah. result in that's me a getting big everything. Hope. Yeah, it's right, a big right, hope right. there. Yeah. Unless there was something in the plot that I missed, but like that seemed to be the crux because she knew about the Gorson case, I think he called it, which was his legal malpractice. Um, and that's what kind of led her to target him in the first place. So, right. Like, and that's why I said when we started talking about this, that he's kind of like not down on his luck, but he's just kind of like an average Joe that just, right. you know, it hasn't hasn't had a lot of luck. He's just kind of slinking by in life and doing the best he can. Uh, but he's got, for some reason, a little bit of a chip on his shoulder, uh, which kind of unwarranted. I fucking loved the yearbook at the end. Yeah. Uh, so so he gets the letter um, and it's the high school yearbook for the uh, Wheaton Cougars. And the opening of the letter says, here is the Wheaton Cougar you asked about. <laughs> like, okay, Kathleen yeah. Turner is yeah, the Cougar he's asking about, I guess now. Um, but yeah, so he looks up and he sees the friend, which is uh, under Maddie's name. So he, he, he sees that they switch names. And um, when he gets Kathleen Turner's picture and her um, quote and everything, they call her the fan, which is another name for a femme, femme fatale. Yeah, uh, like, like that's either her own nickname in high school or something that they gave her. 
our friends and then her quote is to be rich uh, or where do you where do you see yourself in the future to be rich and live on an exotic island cut to yeah. her living on the exotic island. It's exactly like, like it's like it's exactly she got exactly what she wanted yeah, yeah it's like almost like eye rolling but it like works so fucking great you're right know. it's like you <laughs> want to like, roll your eyes but you're like god damn it it's great you know no it definitely works it's fucking great but i like that once the the switch i instantly had the thought of like the doubles the, the double, which is like uh, a constant Hitchcock uh, theme, uh, and just noir in general. So I, the, the two blondes, and like especially when he walks, like that scene we mentioned, when he walks up to the other girl and he's evil and mistaken, so it's like, oh, that's going to be the switch right there. There's going to be something uh, with those two characters. Yeah, really well done. Um, and yeah, I'm sorry I boned that Lawrence Kasdan uh, directed Star Wars, but he directed this film and I thought the direction was actually done really well. There's I like kind of like that end scene where it is on her and then it kind of like pans up and then you see like the credits roll. I don't know, back in the eighties, I think that was kind of like, nobody was really doing stuff like that, you know? I mean, the best directed scene, uh, or at least one of my favorite scenes is like that first, uh, when they first uh, meet at her house, when they're, um, when he finally breaks through the the window to like, and then they start to fuck for the first time. That was it's great. Like, just like the whole scene of leading up to it. So he goes, they they go back to her house together. She kicks him out. Um, he stands at his car, just looking at the house. He walks back in, and she's just standing there, like in the middle of her own house, just looking out the window. <laughs> and he's going I from know. like window to window, with like like a like a fucking like tiger, like about to attack her. And then he decides to just break the fucking window with uh, a chair. And I. I was dying laughing. So I know it's like a little like unnecessary drama there, but I guess what they're trying to do is like she's playing with him so that like I'm yeah. so, I'm gonna oh, make totally. him want it so bad that he can't like fucking help himself. And he's got to break through the fucking door, or break the window, and yeah, yeah, it's hilarious. He breaks the fucking window. Well, it's, and it's, <laughs> he's just inside like a second yeah. ago. <laughs> it's so great. It's like she kicks him out, um, and 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 she. What is it like? it was, I forget what he says, but like uh, she kisses him and he's like, oh, I'm just weak. And then closes the door on him. It's like, oh, that's a perfect setup. <laughs> totally. Yeah, really. And he's got, a, by the way, a kick ass car too. Uh, it's like some kind of like red convertible. It's like adds so much to this like neo noir feel. That's the thing. He's got this kick ass car, kick ass mustache. I mean, he fucking it looks awesome in this movie. Uh, it's, it's definitely very believable that uh, the first half of this movie is he's just having this uh, hot steamy affair with Kathleen Turner. Looking yep. great. Yeah, totally. Well, I mean, I really don't have too much else to say about this film other than I just loved it. If you're out there and you haven't seen the film, you'll enjoy it. I mean, there's no doubt. This movie has a lot to enjoy. Um, and let's just say you want to have a really good time watching two people fuck around. Uh, you know, this movie's for you. It also has all of those good Hitchcock uh, and Double Indemnity, old noir feels that uh, I love especially. And so like, it's it's weird because I feel like those films can't like really exist anywhere than like the 40s, you know? But they obviously do. And it's just weird for me sometimes going to see a movie in the 80s thinking like, oh, this is kind of like, what if this was a movie in the 40s though? It would be so fucking perfect, you know? It's like exactly that kind of a style. And, so, you know, it could be like Gloria Graham playing, playing that, you know, Kathleen Turner role. Hell yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just thinking like them doing this in like the 80s for like Hitchcock is basically us, uh, anybody making a movie referencing John Carpenter now. Yeah, uh, yeah. Basically. And I, I'm, I, I truly believe John Carpenter will only rise in um, influence and uh, prominence over the next 50 years. I think his name will be on the level of Hitchcock, uh, purely for the influence and what he's done for like thrillers and horror and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I just, I see that uh, to be the case. I think that's how strong and influential his movies have been, so. Yeah, I I definitely agree. And I, I think that, you know, the way that you look at his filmography and everything, and then the fact that he has kind of stopped making films, it's kind of like, he knows the kind of films he wanted to make and he's done that. And I don't think he could make those kind of films anymore. Like the world has changed a lot, you know, kind of like seeing uh, the other day, Scorsese had like put in this story that Francis Ford Coppola was on Instagram. And of course, like I 
clicked on it and wanted to follow it. And I thought was interesting. His like first post was just a picture of him and as an it's like an you know older man and he's like to be elder it was like a post about being elderly and what's great about being elderly is that you can tell stories like your grandpa did you know like through the family and because he's got a new film coming out so i'm sure that's why they're doing it um but like i don't know i what would john carpenter what would john carpenter film be like now you know would it have impact i don't know i mean it really doesn't matter it's it's, it's his heyday in the 80s and early 90s uh i mean he's on record like he's he doesn't even want to make a movie like he just doesn't like the um uh process of filmmaking him or he's 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 a perfect old man grump these days that he's but he still is like fully dedicated to like fans and everybody uh, that uh, uh love his movies so he's like still engaged he just doesn't want the hassle of being on a set directing a movie anymore so yeah totally <laughs> which which is like there's something you dare that's like yeah i'm not gonna do a good job so i'm just not gonna do it so i mean i guess that's kind of what tarantino's been saying you know with this next movie coming out um yeah kind of, tarantino is more of the i think the, he's seeing it as like a history like i i He's, he believes in himself. I, I think if he, if he wanted to make more movies, he would be like, yeah, I'm going to make great fucking movies. But I think he's just more looking at it from like, like a 50 year lens. Like what are people, what is my legacy going to be in 50 years? I think oh, that's he's his, acutely aware of that for yeah, sure. Um, he's, I think that's his driving. Um, I saw some uh, pushback uh, on him. Like a lot of people like accusing him of like, like cowering uh, as an artist because he, he's not going to make any more movies or something. And it's just like, is like such a horrible take, like, because they were like claiming like, oh, he just doesn't want to be, uh, he doesn't want to risk making a bad movie. It's like his entire career has been one risk after another. His entire, like everything he's done has been a risk. And just because he doesn't want to actually make movies anymore, he's going to be making art in all other mediums, uh, like writing and stage and whatnot. So yeah. Uh, Right. You don't just like stop being an artist. Maybe you just stop using right. that medium, which is exactly. making yeah. you tell your stories. And uh, you're right. It's risk after risk. And that's why his films are so fucking great. I watched uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood uh, two days ago, three days ago. Oh, yeah. You know, for like the 20th time. Come on. I mean, there's there's a kind of a contrarian. There's a lot of people who do not like Tarantino, which is fine, but like they push back on him. I think largely because of his personality and also the uh, just how kind of generally um, um, adored most of his films are. So, you know, you're always going to have like that natural pushback. So to get likes, uh, especially in the age of social media. So his, but that's the thing is like Tarantino's eccentric, <clears throat> his eccentric eccentricity has always been there. It's not like this yeah. is new. He's been fucking fuck you if you don't like this and what i'm saying fuck you you know this is the way i am and you know autograph hounds outside trying to get his shit he's like hey, fuck off you know like it kind of like uh your favorite director did the other day when uh you know avatar came out and everyone's like yeah james cameron didn't sign autographs and he just put his middle finger up out the window of his car it's like fuck you i guys. didn't i didn't see it i gotta look that up oh this dude it's what, so this good. is what i'm saying this is why i need you as my tmz um <laughs> Uh, source because I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I 100 percent saw it on TMZ. <laughs> yeah, <for sure. laughs> exactly. So I'm looking. I'm always researching James Cameron's career, but not his uh, paparazzi interaction. So that's why I need you to to give that to me. Man, <laughs> yeah. I went. I was out at a cafe, and I swear to God, um, there was a guy who looked just like Cameron. I almost took a picture uh, of him. It wasn't him, but like this this guy, he looked almost uh-huh. like his twin. No, just uh-huh. some random guy at a cafe. I was uh, sitting there. Looked at look like who though? I didn't miss James Cameron. Oh, James Cameron. He looked just like him. I was like, dude. By the way, what film? uh, First Reformed. I I think I forgot to say it. Like the guy who's like fixes the organ or whatever in that film. Like by the way, everyone listening out there, we uh, covered First Reformed last week. uh, So if you want to go back and watch, but that's what I'm referring to. When we were talking about First Reformed in the film, there's a guy that looks just like James fucking Cameron, and I thought for sure I'm like. Pat picked this film because James Cameron like made a made a cameo in it. Do you know the guy I'm talking about? I mean, I know the organ scene when they're fixing the organ. And you're saying one of those guys looks like James Cameron? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not going to look it up now, but like it, 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 definitely not him. I would assume so. 
Um, but I'll definitely have to rewatch that part. So it's hilarious. Well, yeah, anyway. Um, the, uh, last thoughts on Body Heat. Ebert put it on his top 10 of the year when it came out. Oh, he did in 81, huh? Yeah. Oh, I actually got, all right. Maybe we can kind of close it with this. I got a quote, uh, a back and forth from Pauline Kale and Roger Ebert when the movie came out. Okay, so, I can't wait for this. Let's hear it. Pauline Kale, she didn't like it. Uh, she dismissed it, citing, quote, insinuating, it's insinuating hot it up dialogue that it would be fun to hoot at if only the husband sleepwalking manner of the film, or the hushed sleepwalking manner of the film, didn't make you cringe or yawn. <laughs> Let's think about Kale. Uh, like, well, film criticism in, for gen, in general, but like, especially Kale, it's like the 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 poetic prose uh, that you had with the, the um, film critics back then. This is why Tarantino is probably one one hundred percent. And by the way, we should probably end every single like one of these, um, you know, episodes of remainders with what Pauline Kale had, had to say had to she, say about the film, you know? Well, she stopped covering movies in like the early 90s. So for every movie pre-90 that we do, we could definitely do that. Yep. So that was her response. And um, like I said, Eber put it in his top 10 of that year and he responded um, in print uh, to her. So he said, yes, Lawrence Kendrick's Body Heat is aware of the films that inspired it, especially Billy Wilder's Double Indemnity but it has a power that transcends its sources. It exploits the personal style of its stars to insinuate itself. Kale is unfair to Turner, who in her debut role played a woman so sexually confident that we can believe her lover, William Hurd, could be dazed into doing almost anything for her. The moment we believe that, the movie stops being an exercise and starts working. It's like, boom, mic drop from Ebert talking to Kale. Dude, I love the Ebert mic drops. My favorite, I mean, one of the most like iconic is the one with Vincent Gallo. You know that one, right? I know that they, he hated Brown Bunny and then there was like a back and forth. Do you remember, constantly. do you remember what the quote was from Ebert? Uh, I do. He said something about, Gallo said something about his weight and then he, Ebert was something about like, yeah, I'll still be fat and you'll still have always made a terrible. No, movie. he said, <laughs> yeah, yeah tell basically me. what he said. That was it. Yeah, Brown Bunny got screened and he, I think, tore it apart. You didn't like it. Yeah, you gave it and, like zero uh, stars. Yeah. yeah. And, and Vincent Gallo's like went off on a tirade and just said, like, you're a fucking fat fuck, like, obsolete. You don't, you know, I, I, I'm paraphrasing, but it was definitely about his weight. He, he, yeah, he hit totally. him with it about his weight. And then Ebert goes, Yeah, I may be fat, but I can always lose weight. You'll always be the director of Brown Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> oh Boom. man ebert you know Ooh. so good um anyway this movie's great loved it mickey rourke by the way awesome uh young rourke pre i think boxing his way to surgeries um really great role Have you ever and seen, good cast what's, what's his um the pope of greenwich village yeah, I've he's in that. that. He's like also in that uh, Angel Heart, or yeah, I forget. But anyway, yeah, he was in a lot of movies back then that he was like a heartthrob, you know. So I've always heard Pope uh, is very good, but I've never checked it out. So. Uh, actually, to be honest with you, I don't think I've seen it either. Um, okay. I know the name, of course, but yeah, because I should watch more because like the wrestler is is it's certainly my favorite movie. So good. Um, from um, the director is escaping me right now, but that's uh, my third movie of his. Darren Aronofsky. Aronofsky. Um, yeah, that's definitely way up there because that's that movie, I've I've watched and rewatched that movie so many times. Like I was saying last week, with like kind of um, first performance, like that type of character study is just like that's like what I I fucking I'm so um, attracted to it. like i just I, I, that's the, that's the type of vibe that I, I just really get on board with in film in general among yeah. other things but like those are just the, the ones that i can watch and re-watch over and over randy the ram after i watched uh the whale um which was excellent it's like which basically the same haven't thing. Seen. oh okay sorry yeah. but yeah no, you I mean, need to you need to fucking yeah. see it it's great um it's a lot like the wrestler in that way. So I think you'll enjoy it. But um, the wrestler, after we watched the whale, my girlfriend had never seen it and she just, she just loved it. I mean, she loved it. And uh, Darren Aronofsky, like 
those two films fucking rule everything else to me i don't know i like black swan um <laughs> But I yeah. remember back in the day you being ambivalent about him. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, it was like that was definitely Suncoast days. He was making like Pie and Requiem for a Dream. Those those were the the films that you know we 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 were around in the right. movie store talking about. I mean, I could see, yeah, I could see being ambivalent about that. But, um, I think it's fucking great. Like even his like crazy movies that nobody liked, like Mother. I had like such a great time watching that movie. It was Dude, so really? off the wall. Oh yeah, I, I, it was great. I don't okay. think I'm gonna watch it again. But hard uh, disagree there. <laughs> I, like I, said, I don't think I'm gonna watch it again, but uh, I definitely enjoyed the experience <laughs> of it. It was a one timer, but um, I definitely liked what he was going for. There, yeah, so. especially when when the baby gets tossed around at the end, right? Yeah, I'm sure that was like the your favorite part. I mean, that that's fucking hard to watch. Dude. That's right. Yeah. Hard yeah. to watch. That's the shit um, I, I, I'm here for. Yeah. It's bonkers. <laughs> it is bonkers for sure. Well, anyway, Body Heat, great film. Uh, thanks for watching it with me, the first time watch. And everybody out there, let us know what you think in the comments here. We're on YouTube usually where you can see us visually. And then we're also on uh, every podcast host that you could possibly have for free. All you got to do is check it out. And if you're looking for a place and you don't know where to go, go to remainderspod.com and you can find everything there. You've got all the social media. I've been kind of amping up our social media a little bit. I don't know if you've noticed uh it's with the great. trip to the hollywood museum the other day oh you looked like i was so jealous it looked like such an awesome time uh, there were so many good exhibits that i'm sure you were just like fuck yeah well the one thing i didn't send you because i didn't want to go crazy but like even marianne said when we were there she's like do not fucking take photos this whole time like i couldn't help myself you know she's like she's like but don't send pat like every single photo that you have in your thing <laughs> and so then i had the idea i'm like well i'll make a reel about it so you can kind of see it but the one photo i didn't send you was they had this like amazing photo of leslie nielsen as you know vampire and i was like oh why didn't i send pat this instead of the jason goes to hell uh mask <laughs> uh yeah, both would have been totally so. I'm glad, I'm happy you opted for the final Friday one, which is a, which is a great Friday, uh, the 13th movie. And um, yeah, that looked pretty awesome. But uh, I mean, yeah. every one of them would have been uh, applicable. That uh, Back to the Future uh, one looked pretty awesome. Yeah, totally. You know, it's cool because I think like the more and more out here, I I always do stuff that's that has to do with the movies. Obviously, that's why we do this podcast. We love the movies, and it's. Um, one of the great passions of our lives and, you know, things that make us happy, um, happiest, I should say. And they, you know, there's always something I'm doing that has to do with the movie. So I just kind of made this uh, decision that like in between our episodes, whenever I like post about it or whatever, maybe to get some new people interested and understand uh, what we do and who we are, maybe I can post some of those things to like, you know, let them see something that might, uh, excite them the way that we're excited about like museums and locations and then find out about our podcast that way so hopefully that'll work and uh it, it's done that that reel did better than any of the other stuff i've ever posted so we'll see yeah it didn't have our ugly faces on it so uh, people are <laughs> yeah. more excited to, to check it out or whatever so totally but anyway yeah that was fun and then this uh tomorrow going uh up the hill in griffith park to the greek theater to see lost boys oh so picnic good. hang out lost boys in the park with my lady i mean, can't fucking beat it dude i mean really i saw that maybe 10 years ago at a screening that uh cory feldman uh appeared for so i think it was at What's that dining? What's that dining uh, theater in the Burbs? Oh, uh, Hollywood Boulevard. Or, yeah, you know, yeah. I yeah. saw it there with Corey Feldman uh, premiering it. So. I saw Back to Great. the Future there with Christopher Lloyd, Ooh. Emma. Emma uh, 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 what's uh, is it? Emma Thompson who played uh, Leah. Leah. Leah Thompson. Leah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, both of them were there. Uh, no Michael J. Fox, but they were raising money for Michael J. Fox's thing. By the way, did we talk about the Michael J. Fox documentary yet? Uh, yeah, we mentioned uh, we both watched it last week. That's right. Thoughts on it and how great it was, and how how illuminating it was on his life and 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 the grind that is his life, but how he still managed to keep his voice alive. Uh, 
you're right and now i remember we talked pretty in depth about it and yes uh excellent uh i would you know if you happen to have the apple um streaming service check it out because i think it's only on apple right now or i guess in the select theaters right you saw it at the cisco yeah i did i'm having a i'm, I'm just my memory's just going really quick uh just flashbacks to that theater i gotta look for it i have a picture uh that i had signed i said to uh i went to a reservoir dog screening um at hollywood boulevard and michael madsen michael madsen and carradine were both there and i had something signed oh, from oh. both of them it was before carradine's death obviously and um I have not seen that piece uh, for years. So I should probably do some uh, searching through whatever uh, few uh, boxes I have. Similarly, uh, there was a stand-up that w went with a DVD at Suncoast when Back to the Future came out. I think the trilogy actually came out at the same time, or it's like you could buy all three. And the I still have the DVD, obviously. I always talk about it in my brother's attic, but um there was a stand-up and i got to usually you could get to take those things home or just trash them at the end um oh well, by, we fought over those uh, i know i have indiana jones still yeah, like i have nice. an indiana jones <laughs> cut out yes we fought over those for sure yeah probably dumpster dived half of them because you weren't allowed to take them out sometimes um <laughs> but the uh back to the future one that has christopher lloyd and the, the out of time thing and they're looking it was just like them two oh, yeah. and it was at the uh, topper I had Christopher Lloyd sign that at the, Ooh. yeah, two, in 2010. That's when oh, I went there. Yeah. That's so great. Oh, what a treat. And, and man, speaking of who framed Roger Rabbit, that's a fucking crazy performance that Lloyd gives in that movie. <laughs> yeah, like, that guy is iconic. Yeah. But it, it was like, it was so dark. Like, I, it was one of those examples of like 80s movies uh, for kids. Like, they did not give a fuck, uh, like, what nightmares they were going to be inducing in children watching. Because some of those scenes, it's like you don't see anything like that that would uh, be uh, uh, pushed for uh, as like Dude, kids fucking little anything. monsters and shit like that, yeah. you know, like stuff that's like specifically geared for kids, like scary as shit, you know, well, return to Oz is always, I think, one of the quintessential where it's like that's pure nightmare fodder. And it was like just 100 percent produced for kids and Dude, even like never ending story. It's like, yeah. dude, fucking yeah. horse. <laughs> you know oh, what the, the most oh. heartbreaking scene uh yeah seeing a, a, a tree yeah that's um, what i'm saying he's fucking dies in quicksand thank oh. god they bring him back at the end when falcor is flying around otherwise i would have cried <laughs> the entire and half of that movie um, oh man yeah some great stuff back in uh, our youth um no bumpers for the kids back in the day so no no, tr no trigger warnings either you just kind of <laughs> you saw what you saw right well there's some major damage right there roll on <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe that's why we've turned out the way we have huh? right 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 right. um okay what else is going on awesome. anything cool so i'm going to see lost boys you got anything going on in your life that's uh worth talking about i mean my whole life love it uh living the dream uh, yeah. i saw halloween last week which is a great show oh Hammer right fall um awesome at the riv um the only thing that kind of really was a bummer is the amount of fucking phones that are just at shows these days i mean it was kind of an older crowd but like there were some parts in the show where it's like half the people are like have their phone up like videotaping like um, you know what happens to all so. of those it's either like okay maybe somebody like legitimately is like an influencer and like you know uses that for something but half of those more than half of those go nowhere people forget that they're, they're there but they just want to like capture the moment instead you know it just goes in their phone to the, like the weird ether Somewhere. Well, yeah, I, I picture most people kind of recording it. Be like, "Oh, I want to remember this," but it's like it's so insane to like just kind of take an overview of like a crowd and just the amount of people who are watching the show through their phone. It's, uh, it, it's not only I mean it's a little distracting. Uh, like yeah, to anybody like, else who's just trying to watch. Right. Yeah, <laughs> but then it's also like I don't know like, how much you're actually engaged with the show itself uh, with that. So I don't know. There's one time uh, I tell the story really quickly and then we can get on to uh, some other stuff. But um, I played a show in um, the UK. Uh, gosh. Uh, oh, uh, the name escapes me of the town that we're in or the city or whatever. But um, there's like nine people there, right? You know, not many people. <laughs> Love it. We're the opening band and we're playing. And as I'm playing the whole thing, there's a guy like straight up on me, like, 
right in the front he's and you know this was like this the stage was like maybe this big so there's like not a lot of like room i'm not like uh, on a pedestal i'm like basically at eye level almost with this uh folks in the crowd and he's literally like this close to me but he's on his phone and i i, I dude i am rocking my shit like playing you know doing what i do uh and he's if you haven't like, seen darren in live, live uh, i attest that he <laughs> he's rocks and shit so. yeah yeah this is uh, Thank God you're here to like to yeah, let but, people but know that I do that. sometimes, but yeah. So going, going a little crazy and doing my thing and he's on his phone and he's looking at it and not looking up and like <laughs> right in front of me. So I'm like looking, I don't see his face at all. He's buried in his phone. Yeah. And at one point at the end of the song, I said, what's going on? Anything cool going on there or whatever. And he was so embarrassed. I was like, what do you think? No one's going to notice you. You're right up against me here. Like no yeah. one's going to know, like, I don't know. Well, I'm so, you said there were only like a handful of people in the in the whole yeah. venue. Yeah, and, I mean, not he, nine. I might have been like thirty people, but it was like you okay. know lighter than most shows that we've played. You know, but like so if there's that if there's that many people, the the, the dudes, anybody sitting like r- standing right up front are pretty like see, visible to everybody in the whole venue. Well, right? what I kind of figured is that like you know uh, we were playing with a band called medina lake that was the headliner and i have a feeling that that guy was just trying to get a spot you know and he didn't know right. who the hell okay. that line bitch was <laughs> so he's probably just like waiting there for the band to play but like he's on his phone i'm like right, dude, right. he's fucking rude as hell like here yeah, i am yeah. trying to entertain you and uh you know you don't even give us a chance i get it if we suck but you know shit <laughs> Maybe we yeah. did suck. I don't know. I can't, I can't. No, it sounds like you handled that perfectly. I mean, you just, if you can uh, publicly uh, shame somebody just in a little uh, a way, it's usually the best tactic. So. Yeah, I never, I didn't knock the phone down or anything. So I just did that. But uh. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, so before we get into the song pick of the week, do you mind if I do a little self plugging? I mean, uh, of course. I mean, that's Are what I try to it? do all the time. So um, I mean, I usually point out which fantastic new painting you got each week. And this Elmo one, I'm a huge fan of. Oh, thanks, dude. Okay. So yeah, there's like a triptych series that I've done. So I mentioned last week that I got into this great gallery called La Luz de Jesus. And oh my God, I finally got to post that and talk about it. And I'm so pumped to drop off the art. And it is a big deal. This is a fucking big deal for me. I worked really hard right. and it's a big uh, gallery. I'm pumped about it. Um, but I did, I mentioned that I did some other ones to try to, you know, it's a juried exhibition. So you have to like submit things and like the person who curates the art either likes it or they don't. And I don't know the, these ones didn't make it. It's not, not that they're not, you know, I don't know why they didn't pick them, but you know, either way they were part of a series. And that was the one that got in was big bird on the blue, blue line. Did you see that one? Oh yeah. Yeah. I love it. Did you see the book that is reading? Oh, I saw he was reading. I'm sure. No, tell me. So it's a book on stoicism and he's got his um, briefcase there. And so like the kind of the idea behind that one is just like, you know, here's Big Bird goes and like has to entertain kids all day. But in the background, like the world is blowing up and there's like shit on fire and he's on the blue line, just like all of us poor schmucks who have to work in the working place (laughs) do. And like he's reading about, you know, stoicism and how to maintain and i just love that because this is kind of the point of all of the series right like um elmo fucking amazing full of life character that we all love is you know innocent and everything but there's pills in front of him right and it, i'm leaving it sort of up to you to think about like what are those pills are they drugs are they for depression are they for anxiety are they for behavior like to 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 to, you know bring you down to a a moderate level i don't know you tell me but i love that and it's like expression kind of says it all like should i or shouldn't i and i I think this one is so great um they're all oil on wood panel too 12 by 12 and then this one i posted today uh man i really like i really love this one too and this is just like Oh, the, you know, Miss Piggy. Yeah. I, I, I sometimes, see this <laughs> sometimes life is this way. You know, she's so uh, into fucking Kermit the Frog, right? So into him. But when she finally gets him, this is what her life becomes. I just love that shit. Like, what, like, you know, 
what happens when it's not all rose colored glasses, you know? I mean, anybody paying attention to Muppets knew Kermit was going to end up a raging alcoholic. So uh, <laughs> the, the writing was on the wall. And so thinking he's got to take a little responsibility for that. So. <laughs> yeah. So I, th I thought those were kind of fun. And um, then I got to give a little props out to uh, um, a friend of mine, Alex. She came up with this idea. She wanted to do a private class. And so anybody out there, if you're interested, I teach private classes, uh, art classes. You can get those through my website. And she had this idea. She loves Stranger Things. And she's like, hey, do you, would you want to like help me Put together um something with like a demogorgon and so we talked back and forth about what it would be and she's like i really like the idea of it eating a salad because it's different like a demogorgon would usually eat a person right and i was like that's cool i like that you know so this one i just finished uh the other night and it's pretty detailed oh yeah now oh, is that you said demogorgon is that a specific character from stranger things i still haven't seen yep it. yep this yeah. is a and there's a little thing in the in the salad that she likes too it's a like oh, they yeah. become demo could, dogs or whatever. Um, it's I could definitely Dark. see the the carpenter influence in that character design for sure. I mean, right? To, it's like yeah. a flower or something. It's weird. Um, yeah. But anyway, so that's my little plug for that. And then, oh yeah, you've been busy this week, man. Oh my god, you have no idea. Okay, <laughs> so um, but I love it. I fucking love it. I do yeah. art every day, man. I fucking love it. And so. Uh, on top of all that, this is the one that I'm excited for the most. This came in the mail today, and I'm going to make sure that I post it on our social media. Oh, man. So Look if you're not beauty. watching right now, you guys, this is the official Remainders coffee mug. And it says, Remainders, a Darren Varel and Patrick McIntyre podcast. What a delicious treat that is. Awesome, Inside right? Out. Oh, that's that's so beautiful. It's such a great design, by the way. Like, I mean, this uh, design Darren came up with and captures it so perfectly. What do you got? Yeah. So there? when we first started, was that a fake sip or was that real? Um, what's that? What do you have in there? Coffee? No, this is just, just, just water. Yeah, okay, there'll be it. some wine <laughs> in there tonight. But um, the the main thing about the design, um, just because you mentioned it, I remember when I first did it, we were doing books uh movies and then what was the third one? Oh, oh music right and so that was what the three colors represent on our logo um uh, yeah. there oh, yeah. yeah there were always going to be when we when we would have an episode about movies it would be blue or you know the different colors and so i i kind of that's why it incorporates all of that and i still think that that makes sense i know we just talk mainly about the movies uh now but we still talk about literature and we still talk about uh, music so i think it it all makes sense in there and i, I do i like the you know, I kind of like the logo and how that came up. And I like that I added now a Darren Burrell and Patrick McIntyre podcast. You know, I had to put my name first there. So, I mean, I wouldn't expect anything less from you. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Man, it's fucking great to be on some swag with you for this, uh, for this endeavor. I love it. Okay. And one last thing, if you don't mind, and this is a uh, more um, self-deprecating, no, not self-deprecating, but self-indulgent. Uh, so nice. I got this white Varel hat in today. And so, yeah, look at that, baby. This is, uh, I, I have these in, I went, I got one that's red with a black, um, black uh, embroidered Varel logo. And then I have one that's all black hat with a yellow Ooh. embroidered Varel. Um, they're all on my website. This is such a fucking great, cap it fits awesome it's like kind of like we we're just talking about 80s kind of like style trucker hat but they're like they're really really comfortable and uh they look great and then it is a beaut and then i i got this and i have to show it real quick so varel hoodie dude come on <laughs> I love it look at that I'm, I'm wearing this one to the lost boys uh tomorrow when it gets chilly at night fucking love that <laughs> so yeah uh anyway all what we available. need is we need to get your brother uh dressed up in that hat that hoodie and then the white shoes from uh the original vacation that cousin eddie gives clark <laughs> 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 yeah, totally. He, you know what? He's at Disney right now. There's a plain white teaser. Oh, plan. Right. He, he decided to take his son to Disney um, just for a trip. And, and the bonus is that Tom and those guys are playing. 
and he sent me a picture today and no joke it, he bought one of these uh hoodies and it's a uh, but it's like a army colored one nice. and then he bought the hat with the yellow um embroider and he's like representing here at disney and i was like oh fuck yeah dude. <laughs> he was he already beat me to the idea well, yeah totally <laughs> yeah it's kind of funny that you uh you mentioned it so anyway uh those are my uh darrenvarell.com items uh of the week and the remainders mug is on there as well so um we'll post that though on our social media so people can buy one if they want or there's also a t-shirt with that logo as well yeah i'm looking forward to having my morning coffee in uh, one of our mugs for sure, uh, yeah. so. okay it. cool so um song of the week you want to switch over uh let's do it how about you go first what do you feel? all right so I, I went on a run the other day and i've been talking about this lately i've just been loving going on runs because i can again um it. yeah back in in it and it's uh, nice to feel like uh i talked about it last week but just like you know mentally I'm in here working all the time. And so just getting out there and running has been nice. I have to take it a little slower, but that's okay. You know, life changes on you and you just got to do it differently. And so um, when I've been out lately, I've been listening to a lot more music and um, that's another benefit of like going and exercising is putting those headphones on and just like really, you know, digging into something and feeling energized. And there's a lot of stuff I could talk about, but what I kind of threw on the other day um, for like a jog and not a run run was the first Fountains of Wayne record. Have you ever heard that record? Uh, I think the only record of theirs I've listened to is the the one with Stacy's mom, which is an amazing record. I think that's- Yeah, the that's, a third, really, that's our third record. Yeah, and it is one, amazing, yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with their earlier show. This record was like the soundtrack for like me and Tom driving around in his old Bronco back in the day. Um, you know, oh, yeah. I could put, put it to like the soundtrack to like my first girlfriend. Like, it's just like, all of the things growing up and it has so many, it's a, so many great memories are attached to these songs. And it is very simple. It's very like nineties power pop. I believe it came out in 94, maybe 96. Uh, in fact, 96 sounds better to me. Um, but Adam Schlesinger who died of COVID in 2020, unfortunately was a very, very gifted songwriter. And this was his band with uh, Chris Collingwood, Collingswood who's the singer. And I believe those two met in like college and they just started the band. And in this record uh, was them too. And then they kind of like got a band together after that, but it's a major label debut. Um, they had a song called radiation vibe from it, which was their single back in the day. But the song I want to, there's a lot of great songs on here. And, and, and a lot of their songs are kind of like every man, like um, sort of like I'm stuck left in my own hometown where everybody else is moving on outside of me or like this is what our parents go out and do when us kids stay home and play um very simple life stuff um sometimes tongue-in-cheek a lot of times tongue-in-cheek lyrics and stuff like that but there's this like you know adam schlesinger is pretty famous for writing the song that thing you do for the movie uh and so this is his band and the second song on this record is called sink to the bottom and it's literally one of my favorite songs of all time and it came on during a jog the other day and i just it kind of stopped me in my tracks and i was just like wow this song is so good um and i've been thinking about it for a while because it's just it's it's been one of those songs that since i heard it has like been never a skip you know we always hear it and you hear it differently or you just kind of like really makes your day or it brings you back to a time that was simpler uh or beautiful and i just really love this song so anyway that's my pick of the week and um yeah if you haven't heard much of uh that band i i would um say those first two records are really leading up to the third one like their third one was their triumph right but those first two records were really really good too Hell yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I'll definitely listen to it. Like I said, yeah, they're welcome, welcome interstate managers is their 2003 album. With, uh, that's the one with the Stasis Mound. I'm just thinking of the, the Mexican wine, the opener on that album. Yeah, great. That's, that's such a great song. That whole album's great. So, yeah, I should definitely listen to their previous ones. Um, definitely got traction. I mean, they were, their earlier ones are popular on Spotify compared to their other ones as well. Um, but yeah. So you're blowing my mind kind of, I kind of totally maybe knew that. So Adam Schles, 
how do you say his last name? Schlesinger. I'm going to let you just say that. Um, I feel like I kind of knew that he wrote that thing you do from the Tom Hanks movie, but uh, I totally forgot about that because I fucking love that movie. Like I, I watched oh, yeah. the shit out of that movie when I was a kid. Um, that song is like amazing. It's just like, it's amazing that like, it's like, a movie like that hinges on whether or not you actually have a good song or not. Like if they like if 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 they ha didn't have a like such a catchy song, like that entire movie just would have been. It like, is would've... the pul the entire pulse of the movie. Yeah. has to run on that song, and yeah, that uh, has one of the best catchphrases or taglines of all time. And I kind of like have made it my tagline for the last couple of years. Um, the movie or the song. The movie. The movie. So my girlfriend has the poster in her um, apartment, which is another reason why I knew that she fucking ruled when I met her because she had that and the, the <laughs> and that and the Vertigo poster in her place, and I was Ooh. like, uh, this, is, "This is the girl for me." <laughs> but um, the tagline of that movie is um, "Sooner or later, um, that dream you dream becomes that thing you do." Ooh, talk about a mic drop of the tagline yeah <laughs> perfect it's perfect so anyway uh yeah that he wrote like that, that song that movie doesn't get enough love i feel like i feel like there's like nostalgia for it but i mean it certainly wasn't like you know held up as like a, any masterpiece in i mean it's got a huge fan base for the people that love it i yeah. i mean yeah it's not like you know known as the greatest film of all time but the people who love it really really love it you know? yeah yeah so good um <laughs> early um oh, not, his name's forgetting me steve zahn steve zahn yeah he's so good he's so good in white <laughs> yeah. lotus dude uh which i've been meaning to watch yeah i have not checked that one out everybody There's everybody a, i know you're not one. like huge on the tv stuff sometimes not that you're against it I'm but not, a lot of those things they kind they do play out like movies you know what i mean oh totally well i mean all the best not the best but like the writing has just sort of quality obviously in tv over the right. last 20 years that's like the biggest trend of it i guess so, that's timely to talk about right now huh there is oh, yeah totally it's like that's i mean that's what's become so much more popular um in the conversation but um yeah it really is just a um mindset like if i'm gonna put myself in front of a screen i'm just more trained to watch a movie i guess yeah i don't know yeah like i, I should be watching uh some of the uh, better stuff like i I'm, I'm about to binge the last season of secession yeah and um i did i mean some of the tv that i do keep up with is um the new i think you should leave season which i fucking highly recommend some of the best uh sketch comedy of the last uh, 20 or 30 years it's My so girlfriend loves great. that yeah oh, tim robinson is a fucking treasure and those i mean the, the slow burn of those skits uh we'll be watching them for years i think um but yeah i mean i should check it out white lotus yeah and... it's kind of like one of those things for me too like sometimes at the end of the night i don't want to like put a movie on because i know that i want to really like get into it and like if i'm tired or whatever like that's when the tv comes in at the end of the night i've like worked all day you know whatever i'm yeah. doing here and so those like always kind of like end up getting my attention a ton but i go into it thinking like well i don't have to pay as much attention if as if i put on body heat for example right, right. i mean yeah i totally get that like i stop i split movies up all the time like i don't do it on intentionally or anything i'll watch a whole movie i'll try to finish it in one sitting but like i have no problem with just watching half a movie one night and then finishing it the next night or whatever sure. so yeah um so i don't know i don't know I mean, I'm not doing anything uh, wrong by watch, not watching enough TV, but I know there's, I'm, I know I'm missing out on a lot of good stuff. That yeah, yeah, it's all good. I, all I think things. we'll talk a lot once you do watch the session. Um, you know, and then well, the other half is I just re want to rewatch Six Feet Under. Uh, <laughs> so, like, if I'm going to watch a drama, I'll just pop that back on. So. Right. Um, cool. All so right. Your song My pick break. of the week. Yeah, so uh, I have the Cure next week. I'm not picking a Cure song. I've already done that. You've, you've no. been you've been down the Cure path, but that doesn't mean we're done. If you want to add, no, oh, yeah, uh, I'll I'll be uh, recommending their stuff. I mean, one of my favorite bands of all time. Uh, going to see them on a couple shows next week. So I've just been re-listening to them. Um, so not a lot of new stuff, but so one of my picks is a um, instrumental uh, from a band that I really love. So like half the music I actually listen to is like instrumental it's like usually what i put on um 
sometimes more passively if I'm like writing or just working um, at the desk or whatnot. I usually have, I'm not usually putting on anything with like lyrics or anything. And I love like classical music. I love modern classical, post-rock. Um, but again, it's like a lot of, uh, sometimes I listen to it passively and not as engaged, but um, some artists more than others. And Hammock is a band that I really love. Uh, they're kind of a um, combination of like a post-rock, Brian Eno, uh, classical kind of mess, mix between all those three. And um, they've been getting some traction uh, the last couple of years. Um, one of my favorite albums um, that I'll be recommending a song from came out in 2017. It's called Mysterium. Uh, it's the title track Mysterium on uh, Hammock's album. Uh, it's just got a perfect vibe of like kind of what I listen to um, in the background when I'm not listening to like anything like fast, like the Ramones or whatnot. So, um, so yeah, this is a song. It's kind of got like a two, two distinct sections of it. One sounding kind of more um, ambiance and then the second half kind of bleeding into a more classical sounding vibe, uh, almost like a hymn, like a church hymn, to be honest. And uh, yeah, it's just a band that I've always loved uh, since they started making music and one that I, it's kind of like a default um, band and uh, genre that I put on if I'm not listening to anything like actively, so. Cool. Uh, yeah, is it, uh, I've never heard of the band for Hammock. That's the name, Hammock is the name. Hammock, yeah. They've done actually a couple movie scores. Uh, they did a movie score for, um, this movie called Columbus, which I really like, which actually okay. has the actress from White Lotus. Um, is he... Not uh, Stibler's mom. No. It's the younger actress who's kind of like a Southern Americana. Oh, um, which season H are what? Haley you? Lou Richardson. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Columbus, uh, pretty good movie. I saw it at the Gene Siskel. Uh, with John Cho from um, Harold and Kumar and her. It's a pretty great um, character study. Parker Posey's in it. But anyway, they've done a, a Hemp has done a couple uh, scores and I know they did that one. And so, yeah, they just kind of gotten around uh, subtly over the last like 10 years and just a band I vibe with. And like I said, like it's easy to kind of overlook the amount of like modern classical that I really love because uh, it kind of got often gets uh, thrown in the same pot. And, and I mean, I have like an ear that enjoys it, but like, I certainly can't differentiate. I've never been able to differentiate like types of classical musicians or like who does like what piece and whatnot. So it often kind of gets uh, thrown in the same uh, playlist together without uh, uh, a lot of uh, um, separating the artists and whatnot. I have to put that on, you know, a lot of times when, <clears throat> when I paint, I don't really like to listen to anything like too aggressive, you know, uh, <laughs> It's been getting a little old man about it, but uh, maybe this will be a cool soundtrack uh, for that. You mean you're not throwing bottles out. at the wall while you're painting? And, and I, out to, I used put, to. <laughs> you put on, somebody put something in my drink and then just like throw shit against the wall while you're painting? Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, all Dee like songs time. all day long. I just put on oh. anything that Dee Dee's love kills, whatever, you know. I mean, put on mashed potato. That'll make you want to, <laughs> that'll definitely make you want to paint and get in a vibe. Oh, it is Friday. I forgot that that's, our, that's the Friday, uh, the vibes is the Didi Ramon, uh, Didi King record. Oh, Didi King, mashed potato time. Should Ahead just, of its time. Man. I'm like, just going to add like that to the playlist. That, you know? I feel like I'm just going to add that to the playlist yeah. just because. Yeah, it, totally. It feels like a staple. So. Yeah, add that on there. But uh, oh, also in the show notes, maybe uh, put a link to where the people can buy the uh, the swag if they want on the um, yep. uh, if you can't if you can if you remember it. That way, um, if anybody's listening and they want to, they can just go right into the show notes. Hell yeah, promote that stuff. Everybody wants a piece of swag with our names on it. I know mm -hmm. I do. So. Yeah, and you know what? I'll tell you, it's uh, this is year three. Is that right? Um, yeah. So I saw something with, uh, everybody talks about like, you know, it takes five years if you're building a business for like it to become successful. Well, we've got two more years to go <laughs> and, uh, not that, you know, we're not feeling successful, but, um, maybe in another couple of years, we'll have amassed a lot of great episodes for people to binge themselves. And then, 
uh, we'll have more swag as it comes. But I think this is about the right time to to add swag. It's about you know mid the midway of us doing our podcast. If you look at it in the five year business plan, hell yeah, love it. Uh, I've definitely been thinking about some more of the legacy episodes since we hit uh, some milestones. Uh, 50, I know what going 50 is, is your, is your pick. So we're definitely excited for RoboCop at 50. Um, that's uh, definitely one that we're going to be leading up to, but definitely, um, a couple other, like Boogie Nights is one that we just really got to celebrate as an episode. Cause I know that's one that, uh, we've been talking about, uh, forever. So yes, sir. Well, and if, you, right. if anybody's listening, got any other suggestions, we like a lot of movies that we haven't even talk, uh, mentioned probably. So if you're feeling like uh, a discussion on something, we're definitely open uh, to it. Uh, always looking for Honestly, stuff I'm gonna, I'm gonna we put, may forget And about, I'm going to put so. this out there. You know, in the future, it might be nice to have a guest come on from time to time to talk about a film. And even possibly a guest from like a movie that we've covered, you know? I mean, maybe Josh Burge would, would come on and, and uh, you know... We've, oh. we've kind of made contact with him maybe he would be cool enough to like want to come on and talk about his next movie that he's doing with joel yeah i did see that notice that he's uh that has been greenlit so man yeah talk about uh a, a burgeoning de niro scorsese uh duel right there between the two of them so totally he's like in every film that i've seen at least of joel so yeah. oh, so great okay well Thanks for listening, everybody. Like I mentioned before, we're on remainderspod.com. All of the social medias are linked to that. You can buy the new coffee mug and t-shirt there and support the show. But another way of supporting the show is just sharing it, liking it. Um, and then I know that the ratings really help a lot of shows. So if you haven't before and you like our show, please go and rate it on Apple or uh, Spotify, I guess is the other places, wherever you listen, um, it would really help us out. So we appreciate it. And then maybe in the future, we'll give away, maybe we could do some contests, you know, I mean, it, this is an always evolving thing and we're excited to uh, connect with you guys more. So let us know if there's anything you want us to cover and we will do our best to put it on the list. Hell yeah. Rate, review, review and subscribe. I know everybody says it, but it definitely does make a difference. So we appreciate, we definitely appreciate anybody uh, listening still to the end. So it's uh, fantastic. We appreciate you staying with us. Yep. Your time is valuable and we don't take it for granted. We appreciate it. I hope you have a great weekend, Pat. Hope you have a great weekend, man. Do some great stuff. Be artistic, uh, read some great books and I'll see you back here next time. Oh yeah. Talk to you later, bud. All right. See you guys. Bye-bye.